Disasters don't stop for a virus. And national response teams are already feeling the strain. Now, before we start, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and if you already did, do click on the bell button so that you will not miss out any of our new videos. Early in the morning of March 22nd, Ranko Glumak jolted from bed as the world around him shook. The room filled with the mechanical roar of a fallen hair dryer. As Glumak lurched to the appliance to quiet the noise, he spotted a dark crack slicing through his bedroom wall, and he realized his home city of Zagreb, Croatia, had just been hit by an earthquake. He and his family rushed outside into the frosty spring air, and across the city others did the same. But another risk lurked in the throng of people, the novel coronavirus, which had already started ramping up in the region. The quake in Croatia was one of the earliest wake-up calls for people around the world that natural hazards still loom large during the COVID-19 pandemic, including floods, fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, and even volcanic eruptions. The risk is particularly acute in the United States, which now leads the global case count with roughly 640,000 confirmed ill. Models suggest that the country's outbreak may soon be nearing its peak, overburdening healthcare systems, budgets, and supply chains. Already this week, tornadoes tore through the southeastern United States, killing at least 34 people and leaving more than half a million without electricity. Craig Fugate, former administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency FEMA, said, disasters don't stop for a virus. Still, experts stress that people living in disaster-prone regions are not helpless. Personal preparation is more important than ever, from fine-tuning disaster kits to cleaning out gutters and yards of anything that might act as tinder. According to disaster researcher Mika McKinnon, we can always shape a better future. A forecast of disaster as spring sets in, many parts of the country face possible natural hazards. A recent NOAA forecast warns that 1.2 million people throughout the Midwest face risks of major flooding this spring. An early analysis from Colorado State University also suggests that Atlantic hurricanes, which generally form between June 1 and November 30, are more likely than average to make landfall this year. Devastation from extreme weather events has spiked sharply in recent years as climate change drives growth in the intensity and frequency of storms. Greenhouse gas emissions also contribute to extended droughts and more frequent and erratic wildfires along much of the U.S. West Coast. Carleen Anders, mayor of Pateros, Washington, and executive director of the disaster leadership team stated that they've had basically no snowpack down in the low country here in our area, so they know they're going to have a bad fire season. In the United States, the response to disasters is a local endeavor at its core. Volunteers, first responders, and small nonprofits form the vanguard in any calamity. Next are regional and state response teams. The federal government only steps in if the catastrophe crosses borders or overloads local capacity to respond. But people at every level of the response system are facing fallout from the pandemic. Samantha Montano, an assistant professor in the University of Nebraska Omaha's Emergency Management and Disaster Science program stated there's really nothing about how we respond to a disaster that is not in some way impacted by COVID-19. Tornadoes in Tennessee The state of Tennessee serves as a potent example of the steep challenges communities face. The night of March 2, before the virus became widespread in the state, a series of twisters killed at least 25 people and injured hundreds more. The next morning, the community response was swift and sweeping. According to Tina Doniger, the executive director for the Community Resource Center CRC, of Tennessee, a Nashville-based nonprofit that collects and distributes goods during emergencies, we had literally a mile of cars that were either people coming to volunteer or people coming to drop stuff off. Other volunteers fanned out to clean up debris and cut up fallen trees. But the situation would soon change. On March 23, as the COVID-19 case count climbed, Nashville's Metro Public Health Department directed residents to stay home unless engaged in essential activities, and efforts to rebuild ground to a halt. At the CRC, volunteer crews, which usually number in the hundreds, dwindled to 10, per official recommendations. Amy Fair, Vice President of Donor Services for the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee said businesses shut their doors, many fundraising events were cancelled, and financial donations for emergency response slowed or were put on hold. In some ways, Nashville is uniquely prepared. Crews started storing supplies before COVID-19 descended on their region and shoppers drained stores of necessities like toilet paper, gloves, and cleaning products. Doniger said last Thursday that they're going to be the only ones ready if a storm were to hit. Three days later, tornadoes struck the neighboring city of Chattanooga, and CRC was ready to help with emergency supplies. The organization posted to Facebook on Monday stated that their volunteers are packing boxes as they wrote this message. Social distancing during disasters as the situation in Tennessee shows, one of the fundamental challenges is that effective disaster response requires close contact, the opposite of social distancing. Montano said everybody physically comes together, physically converges on a community. 
Teams search for victims in the wreckage of buildings, distribution centers organize lines of volunteers, and survivors gather in tightly packed shelters. But the novel coronavirus adds extra risk to these life-saving activities. Under normal circumstances, more than half of the nation's hospital beds are already filled. But feverish and coughing patients are now pouring in, even as doctors and nurses increasingly fall ill with COVID-19 themselves. First responders are also enduring illness among their ranks. As of this writing, nearly 10,600 firefighters and emergency medical service responders have reported exposure to COVID-19 in the United States alone with almost 5,000 of whom are in quarantine. Meanwhile, response groups are struggling to train the latest batches of emergency volunteers. Trained volunteers make up 70% of the U.S. firefighting force, and learning the ropes often requires in-person physical repetition. Yet training sessions for volunteer firefighters in Patriots, Washington, have shifted online, which limits the precinct's ability to prepare novices to battle blazers. Agencies are also struggling with dwindling funds under COVID-19, as emergency management is frequently understaffed and underfunded even without a pandemic. Erica Artizeros, captain in the San Francisco Fire Department, says she's working to shift her volunteer training program for emergency response online, but she lacks the resources to address the issue. She stated that she is a staff of one and their budget is not growing. These challenges will only amplify as the scale of the potential disaster increases. Major catastrophes usually draw in teams and supplies from afar to augment local response. But the pandemic has been consuming resources, and travel restrictions hamstring movement. McKinnon then said, that means when your local capacity is overwhelmed, you can't reach out for more help. Rewriting the playbook McKinnon said the most effective way to reduce risk is for individuals to take on a greater role. Reporting potential dangers, such as overflowing riverbanks or tendrils of smoke in the distance, can buy crucial minutes for evacuation and response teams. Emergency kits are also vital for anyone living in disaster-prone regions, and they contain many of the same supplies that people bought to hunker down during the pandemic. At the same time, emergency response groups are coming up with creative ways to mitigate disaster. Some agencies are staying nimble to fill in potential gaps in disaster response. Evacuteer, a program dedicated to helping New Orleans residents evacuate during a hurricane, has shifted operations to raise money for shelf-stable food and supplies, since most agencies responsible for this facet of hurricane response are working to feed people who lost jobs due to the virus. Groups are also working to build community bonds, a major part of local resilience. San Francisco Fire Captain Artizeros and her team are encouraging community members to stay connected through the social media hub next door, particularly with at-risk individuals. Having a neighbor that will check in on someone that is elderly when official channels are overwhelmed is priceless. According to Trevor Riggan, Senior Vice President of Disaster Cycle Services, the Red Cross is redesigning shelters to prevent the spread of disease. Shelters are often a collection of cots in an open space, like a gymnasium or community center, a setup where viruses can easily spread. So, the Red Cross is implementing new strategies, such as placing beds farther apart and checking people for symptoms before they enter and throughout their stay. Wherever possible, hotels will be used to keep people separated. Yet shelters still face challenges as healthcare workers are concerned about asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19. Riggan said that's one thing they know they have to get right. The last thing they want to have happen is have someone not evacuate because they're questioning where to go and whether shelters would be safe.